Well, good evening, everyone, and a very warm welcome to our gospel service here in Cumber Free Presbyterian Church, to all who are visiting with us and also those that are joining online. We want to give you all a very warm welcome. We're delighted to have also some of our friends from the Ukraine, and they were here this morning with us, and we want just to welcome you in our Saviour's name. Uh, they're finding it difficult with a language barrier, but hopefully we'll be able to slow down a wee bit so you can understand us. But we're glad to see you, and we warmly welcome you all in the Saviour's precious name. I did open a few windows, by the way. If it just gets a little bit cold, then you can uh, remove the hymn books. I use the hymn books, by the way, to keep them open. I don't know what way the windows are, but I've used the hymn books. So if you're short a hymn book, uh, there's one in the window there. Just pull it, but make sure that you hold the window for you could smash it. Uh, very handy. I also opened the back door as well to let a bit of air in and uh, opened the front door so I took a bit of liberty uh, to do that. So if you're cold tonight, which I don't think you will be, you can blame me. I'll take that but it is very warm. We call it here muggy uh, and it's very clammy uh, but uh, we don't want you falling asleep and I did mention that this morning but uh, no matter how strong you are, I'll tell you, you'll not beat the sleep. <laughs> It always gets the better of us all, but hopefully we'll be able to fix our attention on the worship of the Lord, and uh, we'll give ourselves fully for the full meeting uh, to uh, focusing upon the worship, the reading, and the preaching of the gospel. Let's turn in our hymn books then to the hymn number 98. Number 98, we'll sing it to the tune uh, 657. Uh, King of my life, I crown thee now, which will give the hymn a chorus, uh, that is, uh, lest I forget Gethsemane. So keep that in mind as we sing the hymn number 98, please. And let's all stand as we worship.
again, verse 3. will still our hearts before the Lord in prayer, please. Our gracious and our eternal loving Heavenly Father, it is with thanksgiving and praise that we're found once again in the house of the Lord. We thank thee, Lord, for this opportunity, Lord, this privilege that's given to not only the church but to the unconverted, Lord, to come and hear the glorious message of the cross, to come and hear again the glad tidings of a Savior who came into this world by virgin birth, lived a sinlessly perfect life, then gave himself to untold sorrow and sufferings at Calvary to pay the price for sin. He shed his royal crimson ruby blood that we might be saved. We thank thee and praise thee that we're singing about that hill called Calvary. There is a green hill far away outside that city wall where our dear Lord was crucified, who died to save us all. And we bless thee, our Father and God, that Christ came into this world and died an atoning death. We praise thee for the sorrows he bore as the sinner's substitute. He was the sacrifice necessary to turn away divine wrath. He was the offering, O God, needed to pay the price of sin. And we thank thee for God's scapegoat. We thank thee for God's lamb provided. We praise thee, the lamb of the old Jewish economy. It was personified there on the banks of Jordan when John the Baptist cried, Behold, the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. We thank thee and praise thee that he is the Lamb for sinners slain. We bless thee, our Father, that he is the Savior of the body and the Savior of the world. We rejoice that he is the Redeemer of God's elect, and we praise thee that he is the only mediator between God and men. He's the man, Christ Jesus. We thank thee that he is the way to the Father. He is the truth that dispels every lie. He is, O God, we believe, not only the only way and the truth, but he is the life, and there's no life outside of him. We're dead in trespasses and sins. We will suffer eternal death in hell. But we thank thee that Christ has come to give us life and to give us life more abundant. We thank thee, O God, for that eternal life. And Lord, we praise thee that when we know him, we have eternal life. When we believe on him, we shall never die, but we shall live forever. And we bless thee and thank thee, O God, that there is such a thing as eternal life for the sinner. Lord, as opposed to eternal death in hell, there is an eternal life in heaven. And we pray, O God, that individuals in this house and those who are listening online, Lord, will recognize their need of repentance and faith, that they will recognize the greatest need of their heart is to have their sin forgiven, to find peace with God through the blood of the cross, and to be saved by sovereign grace. So hear our humble prayer and cry tonight. Come on a rescue mission to this house. Single out individuals gathered in thy presence and grant, O God, you will bring them savingly to the cross. And then for those who are listening online, we thank thee for those who tune in, those who are saved and those who are not. And we pray that even now, O God, even though they're not present in the building, that they will know something of the presence of the Lord wherever they are. And we pray, O God, you will solemnly the very atmosphere in the home or even in the hotel or wherever they are. And we pray, O God, that they will be gathered in even to the service as if they're sitting here in the building. And we pray, O God, you'll bring to them the glorious message of the cross. And we pray, Lord, that sinners would be converted and thy name 
honoured and glorified. Take of our thanks for past blessings. We commit this service into thy hand and into thy care and keeping. And we pray, Lord, you will be pleased to defeat the devil, we beseech thee. Shut the devil outside the door. We pray, Lord, you will open blinded eyes. You will unstop the deaf ear that you'll break through the hardened mind and send light into the darkened understanding. We pray that sinners will see their sin tonight, that they will tremble in the presence of a holy God, a God who hates sin, a God who must punish all transgression of his law, a God who will bring all sin into account one day, a God who will, O oh God, judge and will not, Lord, acquit the wicked. We recognize, O oh God, that judgment will be meted out at the end and there will be judgment without mercy and we cry O God in this day of grace in this season of opportunity that sinners will recognize that this is their time this is their moment this is their season this is the day of salvation and they will repent of their sin and come by faith to Christ, not only here in Cumber. And we thank thee for what you have been doing. We pray, O oh God, for all other places that are faithful to the blood and to the book. We pray, Lord, both inside and outside our own denomination, that will bless the faithful proclamation of Christ tonight. We pray, Lord, that every ambassador of the cross may know perfect liberty in preaching Christ. And we pray there'll be signs following and fruit for the labor of all thy servants and loving father in answer now to prayer be pleased to save the lost restore the backslidden revive the church we ask these things giving thanks in the savior's precious and worthy name amen could we turn in our bibles please to acts chapter 16 <clears throat> acts chapter 16 there are some big words. I was told whenever we were reading scripture, and I know it was only a joke, but sometimes it might help when you come to big words or names of places that you really find difficult to pronounce, and you just cough. Well, if this was the case, you'd be saying to me, I've got COVID, <laughs> shouldn't be here. A lot of difficult names, and no doubt we'll not get them right, but we'll persevere with the reading because we want to get to the heart of the message. So, Acts chapter 16, and we'll break in at the chapter and verse 1. Acts chapter 16 then, and the verse 1. Let us all hear and read together the word of the Lord. Then came he to Derbe and Lystra, and behold, a certain disciple was there named Timotheus, the son of a certain woman, which was a Jewess and believed but his father was a Greek, which was well reported of by the brethren that were at Lystra and Iconium. Him would Paul have gone forth with him and took and circumcised him because of the Jews which were in those quarters, for they knew all that his father was a Greek. And as they went through the cities, they delivered them the decrees for to keep that were ordained of the apostles and elders which were at Jerusalem, and so were the churches established in the faith and increased in number daily. Now when they had gone through Phrygia and the region of Galatia and were forbidden of the Holy Ghost to preach the word in Asia, then they were come to Messiah and essayed to go to Bithynia and the Spirit suffered them not. And they passing Messiah came down to Troas and a vision appeared to Paul in the night. There stood a man of Macedonia and prayed him, saying, Come over into Macedonia and help us. And after he had seen the vision, immediately we endeavored to go into Macedonia, assuredly gathering that the Lord had called us for to preach the gospel unto them. Therefore, loosing from Troas, we came with a straight course to Samothracia, and from thence to Philippi, which is the chief city of that part of Macedonia, and a colony. And we were in that city abiding certain days. And on the Sabbath we went out of the city by a riverside, where prayer was wont to be made. And we sat down and spake unto the woman, or the women which was ordered thither. And a certain woman named Lydia, a seller of purple of the city of Thyatira, which worshipped God, heard us, whose heart the Lord opened, 
and that she attended unto the things which were spoken of Paul. And when she was baptized in her household, she besought us, saying, If ye have judged me to be faithful to the Lord, come into my house and abide there. And she constrained us. We lend our reading there at the verse 15. We know the Lord will indeed bless the public reading of his own precious and infallible word. I'm going to ask our brother, Mr. Colin McKee, please, if he'll come forward. He's going to make some necessary announcements. Thank you. Well, it is good to see you all in God's house tonight. We bid you welcome, and also those listening online. Trust that the Lord will speak to each of our hearts and bless even our time in God's house tonight. I want to remember this week, the special holiday Bible club week. Each night, the meetings will take place at 6.30. As I said this morning, pray for these meetings that the Lord will bless and the Lord will work, even in the hearts of the boys and girls, and even that the workers would have the joy of leading boys and girls to the Savior. The buses will be out from 5.30 onwards. We'd ask the workers to try and be there for 6. And then remember, next Lord's Day evening at 7 p.m., the special parents' night. And try to get the boys and girls in and their mums and dads and all their family members. Even pray for that special service. Pray for Robert even as he would take that meeting. Remember the prayer meeting on Tuesday night at 8 p.m. And the late night men's prayer meeting at 10 p.m. Uh, next Lord's Day, the services at the usual times, 11.30 in the morning. I think I announced the Sunday school was back next week. And I think I w- was worrying Mark there and all the teachers, but you've another two weeks off yet, so don't panic. So next Lord's Day is 11.30. And then we will be waiting around the Lord's table after the morning service to remember even his death and resurrection. As I said this morning, remember the church barbecue, Saturday the 2nd of September at 6.30. As I said, it's for everyone. It's for even young and old. It's for family and friends. It's a thank you for all that was done, even during the mission and even over the summer. And even as we start all the new works again, we'd love to see you all there. It's free of charge, so come along. There's a wee sheet in the hall of the church. We'd encourage you, please, to try and put your names down there so we've got a rough idea of numbers even for that night. As again, the annual missionary council weekend will take place this year between the 3rd and the 5th of November. It'll be in the Silver Birch Hotel in Uma, and there's booking forms in the hall table there. I think they need these forms in as soon as possible, so if you're planning to go, please get them in as soon as possible. Thank you. Well, we do thank our brother very much indeed for making those announcements, subject as always to the divine will of the Lord. Let's turn in our hymn books to the hymn 229. 229, Jesus is tenderly calling thee home, calling today, calling today. Why from the sunshine of love will thou roam, father and father away. 229, we'll stand together please as we sing. Let's all stand as we worship. Jesus is tenderly calling me home, calling you today, calling you today. Oh 
first verse and chorus all over again, please. Let's turn in our Bibles, please, to Acts chapter 16. And just with our Bibles open, we'll just still our hearts for a few moments before the Lord in prayer, please. Our gracious and our eternal loving Father, as we come now to the preaching of thy holy word, we look to thee, Lord, for much needed help and grace. We pray, Lord, for the solemnizing of every heart. We thank thee, Lord, not only can we sing and say Jesus is passing this way, but Jesus is calling today, calling today, calling today. And we pray, Lord, that sinners will not go further and farther away, but rather they will come to Christ as he calls them. We think of, Lord, the blind man, Bartimaeus, and how it was said of him, Arise, for the Master calleth for thee. And Lord, in love and mercy, you're calling sinners to repentance. You said, Lord, I am not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. And Lord, we pray that they that be sick need the physician, not they that are whole. And we pray, O God, that you will come and you will show sinners their sin-sick soul. Show to them not only their sin and the horrors and terrors and consequences of it, but show to them the way of escape. Show to them the wounds of Calvary. Show to them the fountain filled with blood. Show, O God, sinners the way to the cross. Show them the way that leads home to heaven and eternal life through Christ, the only Saviour. To this end, Almighty God, we ask that you'll be with us now. Undertake for circumstances in the house and grant, Lord, for thy hand in mercy and love upon each one of us. We commend ourselves to thee and ask for thy presence and blessing. Be with me now, thy servant. Grant unto me, Lord, the anointing and the infilling of thy spirit with wisdom and with power. And Father, in answer now to prayer, be pleased to bless the preaching and the ministry of thy holy word in the salvation of lost souls. We ask these things in Jesus' precious and worthy name. And the people of God said, Amen. You know, there are three conversions recorded for us here in the 16th chapter of the book of Acts. Uh, each one of them displays something of the wondrous and marvelous power of God in the conversion of a sinner. The first conversion is that of a lady called Lydia. In Acts chapter 16, verses 13 through to 15, it says remarkably of this uh, lady, at whose heart the Lord opened, that she attended unto the things that were spoken of by Paul whose heart the Lord opened, that she attended to the things which were spoken of by Paul. You know, what power was exercised in that single act of the opening of a sinner's heart? I tell you, there's no power on earth, and there is no power in hell. There is no power known to mankind that can do such a work. Lydia's heart was opened by the Lord, that she, for the first time, in her existence, gave attention to the things that were spoken in the gospel. Now, if that is what is needed to see a sinner saved, that the Lord has to work in such a supernatural way and that the sinner cannot effect this of their own will, that no preacher and no believer could ever effect that experience in the life of a sinner, then, and if only God can do that work, it necessitates the church to pray for every gospel meeting and for every lost soul in our family and among our friends here in the church family that God would do something, that he would open the heart of the sinner. That's why we have the half hour 
of prayer before the gospel service. We recognize without the Lord, we can do nothing. And if that is what's needed, the Lord to open a heart that only he can do, then I say this to you. It necessitates that half hour of prayer before every service in this house that God would do such a work. It necessitates on a Tuesday evening the time of prayer and Bible study, the prayer meeting. And I say this, those times are precious in this house that we might see something of conversion, God working and opening hearts. The second conversion is that of a woman who was possessed by a devil or the demon-possessed woman. Verses 16 through 18, we'll not take time to read then. But oh, for a demonstration of the Holy Ghost power like that in our gospel meetings, when the devil is defeated, when his work is undone, and sinners are delivered from his dangerous and deceitful and damning clutches. Oh, for an outpouring of the Spirit that would open the heart of the sinner, that would defeat the work of the devil, and sinners would be gloriously converted. The third conversion is that of the Philippian jailer. An earthquake God had to send to shake this man, not only in his foundations, but in his very soul. Such powerful events in the natural realm awakened this careless, godless soul to his need of salvation. He sprang in with a light to Paul and Silas and he cried out those famous words, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And the answer came echoing through the dungeon or the jailhouse, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. And all of these conversions, the conversion of Lydia, the conversion of a demon-possessed woman and the conversion of the Philippian jailer, they all are a display of the power of God in salvation or conversion. But did you ever consider something equally wonderful in the conversion of a sinner called the providence of God? Nowhere better do we see not only the power of God, but the providence of God at work in salvation than in what is known as the conversion of Lydia, a seller of purple. And I want you to notice how the Lord was working in order that this woman might be saved. You see, Paul was seeking to preach the gospel in certain places, but the Holy Ghost forbid him. Now that's a remarkable thing. Paul wanted to go into Asia Minor. But the Holy Ghost forbid him. Look at chapter 16 and the verse 6 and see what it says. Now when they had gone through Phrygia and the region of Galatia and were forbidden of the Holy Ghost to preach the word in Asia, after they were come to Messiah, they essayed to go into Bithynia. But the Spirit suffered them not. Now these are places that Paul desired to go to preach the gospel. And the Holy Ghost said no. He forbid Paul to go into that region. And believe me, if Paul had gone into that region, Asia Minor would have been converted. I don't believe you would have had the Muslim, the, the Muslim and Islamic world where it is today. I don't believe for a moment that some of those mystic Eastern religions and some of those false religions would have surfaced today if Paul had not been forbidden to go into Asia Minor and in other places as well, although we know that the Lord did establish churches there and a work for God was done, but on this occasion, the apostle Paul was redirected by the providence of God. The Spirit then gave Paul a vision. We'll not go through the Bible reading. We've done it already. But he saw a man of Macedonia and that man stood and I would imagine he says he saw a man. And I'm sure that man in, in some respects looked like a pauper. And he cried to Paul, come over to Macedonia and help us. Bring the gospel to Macedonia. Bring the gospel to our area. Which by the way would have been Philippi. Which by the way would have been Corinth. 
which, by the way, also would have been Thessalonica. And we know that Paul had great success in all of those major cities, and churches were established. We know that. But it all was in the providence of God. Now, parallel this. There's Paul. He wants to go into Asia Minor. He wants to preach there. And the Spirit of God forbids him to go. And then at the same time, he gets a vision of a man calling him into Macedonia. And he went and he traveled through some of those cities and he settled in a place called Philippi. But I said to you, parallel what's going on here. There is a woman called Lydia and she lives in Thyatira. Now, where is that? That's in Asia Minor. And the Holy Ghost forbid Paul to go there to preach the gospel. But yet remarkably, you see, this woman was a seller of purple. And she had a thriving business. And she traveled to Philippi because it was a Roman colony. And it was the Romans that desired the garments that she made. She took shellfish and she crushed them. And there was like a scarlet dye. And she used it to dye the garment. I was preparing a sermon. In fact, I have the sermon already prepared from Isaiah chapter 1. I'm not going to digress into it. It'll save for another gospel meeting. But I will preach it in the will of the Lord from Isaiah 1. And the scarlet and the crimson. And whenever that shellfish was crushed, or even the scarlet worm was crushed, the juice that it produced was used as a dye to dye garments. And let me tell you, when those garments were dyed, the, the stain was irremovable. You could not take the stain away. And she was a seller of purple in that she made royal robes and she sold them. But the Romans desired royal clothing. They were clothed like princes. And she went to Philippi, which, by the way, was in Macedonia direction. And it was there that she set up her business. It was there that she made an awful lot of money. And it was there that the Romans bought the garments that she dyed and she produced. And they loved to wear the purple trim trimmings, the symbol of royalty. And Lydia could expand her business in Philippi more than anywhere else because there was a greater demand for her goods. Now, providentially, she was originally from Thyatira, and she arrived in Philippi, the very place where God says you'll not go there to preach. And if Lydia had stayed there, she would not have heard the gospel. But God moved her to Philippi, and then God brought Paul to Philippi. I told you, not only do we see the power of God in salvation, but we see the providence of God working, bringing events to happen. We saw something of that, I'm sure, in our own lives and experience, the providence of God. Somehow, we don't know how, but never was Lydia was in Thyatira, even though it was Asia Minor, even though Paul was forbidden to go to preach Christ there, Lydia, for some reason, embraced Jehovah, the God of Israel. She became, in Asia Minor, she became a proselyte of the Jewish religion. And we know that because we find her among the Jews worshipping along the river bank. And somehow we know that pagan religion didn't satisfy her. And she was a woman that was searching for truth. And she believed that Jehovah was the true and the living God. And she believed that salvation was of the Jews. And she embraced the Jewish religion. And she became what is known as a proselyte. So when she arrived at Philippi, she looked for a synagogue, but there was none. There was no synagogue, even though it was a Roman colony and many Jews had gone there as well. And there was relative freedom. There was no synagogue. I'll tell you why. Because a synagogue needs 10 households, 10 key holders. Did you know that to establish a free Presbyterian church anywhere in the world, it takes 10 key holders before constitution. The same goes for the synagogue. But there were not 10 households. There was only a few Jewish women. No households. 
just a few Jewish women. And they met along the river Ganites. And along there they worshipped God according to Jew Jewish law. They sought as best as they could to follow the Jewish Old Testament economy. Obviously they couldn't sacrifice. They tried to keep the law as a means of pleasing God. And she joined with these ladies. She embraced Jehovah and she worshipped him every Saturday, every Sabbath. And while she was worshipping there, Paul arrived in Philippi. And you know what Paul does on his missionary journeys, don't you? The first thing he looks for is what? A synagogue. But there was no synagogue in Philippi. There was just a few when he made inquiries. Oh, those Jews, there's a few of them. They're ladies. And they meet there by the Ganites River. And you should go there and worship with them if you want to find Jews. That's all there is. That's all that are worshipping. There is no synagogue in Philippi. And so Paul joined himself with those ladies. And he began them to preach the gospel. And he came along. And the rest of the story we've already read and you know it very well. Therefore, I believe in the power and in the providence of God. And I believe that God is at work in every gospel meeting. So therefore I can say to you tonight that if you're here and you're not saved, you're not here by chance. You're not here by mistake. I remember preaching in Lisburn on, well, obviously many occasions, but there was one statement that I made and a man came to me and he says, you know, you made a statement one night in Lisburn. I wasn't present, but I want to tell you, a relative of mine was present. And he was miles away, thousands of miles away. And he was listening in his car to a CD of you preaching in Lisbon. And he's not saved. And I said this, that you're not here tonight by chance. But you're here because of providence. God has you here because he's speaking to you. And that man was driving his car and he came under conviction. And he stopped the car and he thought, why am I driving all these miles to church? This man is right. I am not here by chance. I am not going to that meeting by chance. In the providence of God, he has me there. And that man came through for the Lord, by the way. And he got saved that night in that meeting. And he recognized not only the power of God to convert, but the providence of God in ordering affairs that you would be here tonight. We have many friends on holiday. I don't think there's a man or a woman, not a single member of our session. And if you were to take the smartest people in this church, notice I've ruled out the session right away. <laughs> if you were to take the smartest people in this church, just made a big mistake by mentioning the session before that, no matter how intelligent they are, they could not predict who would be here tonight. Most of us would not know who's here until we come out of the prayer meeting and take a step through those doors. In fact, some may not even realize who's here tonight. They could go in and out of this church and if I was to say to them, was such and such there tonight, they would say to me, no, I don't think so. And someone said they were because they were sitting beside me. But God knows, young person, older person, and even those that are listening online, you're not tuning in by chance. You didn't somehow hit a button on your laptop or phone or iPad or tablet or computer. You didn't somehow switch on to YouTube on your television. You didn't somehow come to Cumber first because it would started before all the rest. I tell you, God has you here and listening. In providence. And let's come therefore to consider together the conversion of Lydia. And the providence of God. And the power of God in her conversion. I want you to consider this woman first of all. That outwardly Lydia looked right. Outwardly she looked right. In fact if we did not have the detail. That is given to us in Acts 16. We would have concluded that somehow Lydia had come to saving faith in Christ. But look at verse 14. And if we were to leave that phrase out, this is how it reads. Listen to me. Look at verse 14. 
It says, A certain woman named Lydia, seller of purple of the city of Thyatira, which worshipped God, heard us leave the little phrase out whose heart the Lord opened, and that she attended unto the things that were spoken. She worshipped. She heard us. She attended the things that were spoken. Now, if we leave out that phrase, whose heart the Lord opened, we would not have known that she was an ungodly and an unconverted woman. We would not have known that. We would have concluded, if we had no other record but the Bible, to put in the little phrase, whose heart the Lord opened, we would have said that outwardly, Lydia looked right. Lydia was an individual who had done well in life. She was rich, but not redeemed. She was religious, but not redeemed. I want to tell you something. She gave no evidence in her life of immorality. She gave no evidence in her behavior of sin and wickedness. She was a businesswoman who had integrity. And the Romans flocked to her because she was a woman who dealt honestly with money and with those who came to buy from her. Lydia was a woman of means. Notice it says in verse 14, she was a seller of purple. Her business was extremely prosperous and it brought her vast riches. And most people in Bible times believed that a person who was filthy rich was blessed of God. The disciples marveled when the Lord says not many, now he didn't say not any, not many rich shall enter the kingdom of God. And the disciples marveled and said this, then who can be saved, Lord? Who can be saved? Because they imagined, they believed that somehow if a person was wealthy, that God had blessed them. And therefore, they could not be lost in hell. God had blessed them with wealth and riches. Now the poor man and the pauper and those individuals, they certainly aren't blessed of God, so therefore they will perish. What a foolish mistake to make. I want to tell you something. Her wealth gave her a standing among society. She had respect. She was an honest business lady. Many may have even looked up to her. Maybe even admired her. Maybe even saw her as a great example in the work ethic. A woman who has done well. And she has moved from Tharatara. She has come to a strange city. And she has been as successful there as she was when she first started. She has made quite a lot of money. They imagine she's blessed of God. And then they go on to say, don't they? That this woman must be no, uh, generous as well. No doubt she would have helped with the synagogue eventually. No doubt she would have helped the poor in Philippi. We have no doubt whatsoever that this woman being a worshipper of God, as it tells us there in the chapter, that she would have been kind to her fellow man. But her riches did not bring her happiness because she embraced Judaism. She left pagan religion in Asia Minor. She left all the idols, and there were thousands of them. She rejected the false gods of that region and that area. And she embraced one true and living God, Jehovah, the God of Israel. And she embraced his commandments and precepts. And she began to live by them. How do we know that? The Bible doesn't say that. It does. It tells us that on the Sabbath day, that's the keeping of the law, Lydia was found worshipping on the Saturday, the Jewish Sabbath, with fellow Jews, even though she was a Gentile proselyte, baptized into and received into the Jewish faith. She was searching for something that money couldn't give her. And she was looking for something that wealth never brought to her. She eventually learned of Jehovah God and she embraced Judaism. But it was dead religion because her heart was shut to the Savior. It was closed to the Son of God. 
It'd be a foolish for a man or a woman to imagine that riches somehow could bring lasting satisfaction that would make your life happier. It wouldn't. Believe me, it wouldn't. Christ alone can satisfy. And true happiness, contentment and satisfaction and lasting peace will never be found in money. It will never be found in silver but the Savior. It will never be found in gold but God. It will never be found in money but the Master. Christ has taken the guilt and punishment of sin upon himself. That's the very source of all misery and pain and anguish. And as the substitute, he has broken the power of sin. And there on Calvary's cross, he finished the work. He shed his blood in order to bring life to sinners. And there's no lasting happiness in money. And you cannot take it with you. I said that on the funeral on Friday, or whatever day it was there last week. I said that at the funeral. and mentioned to them last Monday. And I said, you know, have a look. And you could see the doors were open. I could actually see the hearse. And I said to the congregation, bigger than this one, I says to them, I can see the hearse. There's no tow bar on it. And Jacqueline cannot bring anything with her. She came into this world, a living soul, and she'll go out of it. A living soul. Now, have you ever thought about your soul? I told them, spoke to them. But I'll tell you this. You're here providentially that you might hear this gospel message tonight that nothing you have in this world will satisfy. She was not only, I believe, a woman of means, but she was a woman of morals. Notice it says in verse 14, it says that she worshipped God. Verse 13, she kept the Sabbath. Verse 13, it says where prayer was wont to be made. She was a woman of prayer. She was a woman that tried to keep the law of God to please God. And then we find her worshipping God in verse 14, living in in, uh, regard to the law righteous. She was a devout, God-fearing individual. Yes, Lydia was a good person, but outwardly she had morality. Outwardly she had righteousness, comparative righteousness that is. She had religion, but she had not redemption. And she found nothing of peace and satisfaction in those things. There was an aching void in her life, something badly missing that she could only fill with riches and religion, but it didn't satisfy. The answer to her need was the Lord Jesus Christ. And providentially, here's a woman in great need, a woman who's seeking and a woman who's searching. And she has found nothing in riches and she has found nothing in religion. She has found nothing in means and she has found nothing in morals. It's because she hasn't Christ. If you haven't the Lord, you have nothing. I want you to think secondly. Not only outwardly did Lydia look right, I want to tell you inwardly, Lydia was not right. Now this is important. Inwardly, Lydia was not right with God. Notice what it says in verse 14. She heard us. She attended to the things that are spoken. And the Lord opened her heart. Now that's a remarkable statement. One, she heard The gospel. But listen, the word in the Greek is different from just you hearing it over the years that you have heard. This word actually means she heard as if it was the first time, as if she had heard a million times. But on this occasion, God opened her heart. God opened her mind. God opened her eyes. God opened her ears. And she heard. For the first time in her life, She understood her need to be saved. We have preached in missions and meetings for years. And sinners have come in and have gone out and they've never understood their need of a saviour. But then in their testimony, when they do get converted, they say this. You know, it was like a light coming on. It was as if the penny dropped. I saw it. Well, that's what happened to Lydia. So I tell you, inwardly, she was not right. A remarkable insight into the spiritual condition of a good, God-fearing, religious woman is given. And it's a foolish mistake to believe because people go to church. And people pay their tithe. And people say their prayers and they read their Bible. It's a foolish notion to think that that constitutes a Christian. 
I have known of unsaved who listened to me, who read their Bible and prayed for at least half an hour in the morning before they went out to work. One individual was Gordon Murdoch, Margaret Hill, before he was saved. And I know other individuals who gave more to the church financially than any other person who was saved nearly. And these individuals were unconverted. They prayed. They read their Bible. They went to church. They tried their best. And outwardly they looked right. But inwardly they were not right. I got a phone call from the late Mary Stuart Johnson. A dear friend of my, mine and my wife's. And she says, Reverend Martin, I need to speak to you. And I need to speak to you as soon as possible. My first thoughts were that she was going to plan her funeral. I went round to her house and I says, Mary, what's wrong? She said these words. She says, you know, I do not have what you preach about on a Sunday night in Lisburn. And I says, Mary, hold on a second now. I preach salvation on a Sunday night. Are you telling me you're not saved? She says, I'm not saved. I'm not. And here's what she said to me. I says, Mary, did you ever call upon the Lord in your life? No. Did you ever come to Christ in your life? No. And here's what she said. I was in a certain church one night. And the preacher preached. And he called for a show of hands. And I put my hand up. And that's it. No one spoke to me. No one counseled me. And I says, no one. No. I was told if you put your hand up and you prayed a wee prayer, go to a certain room, pick up a disciple's pack, and then come on the Tuesday night. I, I picked up a disciple's pack. I went on a Tuesday night. The person who was there to do the disciple's class didn't turn up or was late. And it was no good. And I says, Mary, have you sat for four years with your hand in the air and no one has pointed you to Christ? She says, I have. She says, I need to get it sorted tonight. And she, or today, and she came to Christ, Mary Stuart Johnson. I did her funeral service. And I want to tell you something about her. She was the nicest lady. She was a nurse all her life. The kindest lady you'd ever meet. A lovely person. Every way you would imagine a Christian. And when she came to church, there wasn't one person in Lisburn Free Church that ever believed that she wasn't saved. But outwardly she looked right. But inwardly she was not right. Let me tell you of Mary Philpot, who passed away, I think it was this year. I went round to her house. I sat in Ambleside Court in her little bungalow. And she is a Belfast lady and she speaks with a strong Belfast accent. I'd love to do it for you. And she never talked. She always shouted. And if she was talking to me, she would have gone like this. Now, Reverend Martin! And it was as loud. And I used to sit. And I'm telling you, it was a wee small room and your ears were ringing. And she was very loud. And she always seemed to be an aggressive woman, but she wasn't. But she just came across like that. Maybe that's a Belfast thing. Sorry for offending anyone that comes from Belfast. But I'll say this. When I think, and she said to me, you know, I'm not saved. I says, you're not saved. She came with another lady called Thelma Marsden. Thelma was the lady without the hat. We all imagine Thelma wasn't saved and Mary was. And for years they attended our church. And Mary said to me, I'm not saved. And thankfully I had the joy of pointing her in her own living room to the Lord. I went round to see Thelma. Thelma, Mary Philpott has come to the Lord. I heard that. Are you saved? Oh, yes, I was saved many years ago. You never judge the book by its cover. You see, outwardly you may look right, but inwardly you're not right. David and May Friars, just a few months ago I took part in the funeral service of May, helped with Roger Higginson to bury May, so took part in David Friars' funeral as well. For over 30 odd years, maybe more, they attended Lisburn Free Presbyterian Church. They sat exactly just around about where John Hill and Sharon are sitting right now in this church. That's exactly where they sat. 
My mind is taking a photograph. I could tell you, every person as well in this church and upstairs, where you sit. I carry that as a photograph in my mind. And when you change places, you confuse me. I'm easy confused. <laughs> Sitting over there every Sunday, never missed. Suit, shirt, tie, dress, hat, Bible, never missed. Never missed. Everybody believed they were saved. Everybody. Nobody doubted. David, Friars and May. I came round to the house. I asked them point blankly, are you saved? And David broke down uncontrollably. And he says, I'm not. And they never forget it. Never forget it. He cried and cried and cried. My first thoughts were, I have offended him by asking him this. And then his wife got up and sat on the edge of the armchair. Put her arm around her husband and says, David, David, what is wrong with you? What is wrong with you? What is wrong with you? And he couldn't answer her. And then he lifted his face, a broken man. And he says, May, May, will you come to Christ with me? He said that. And she says, I will, David, I will. And the two of them turned to me. I didn't know what to do. <laughs> no textbook for that one. And I says, well, folks, we'll just come to the Lord together. And they did. They came on that Sunday morning, arm in arm. They met one of the elders in the church and they said, you know, this is the first time we have come to this house as born again Christians. I want to tell you something. It's one of the biggest shocks in Lisburn Free Church to this day. And it taught us something very important. That outwardly you can look right, but inwardly you may not be right. And on this occasion, we hear these words that she heard. That's a remarkable word because it means to hear with the understanding. So that tells me there are people who hear the gospel and it's over their head. Some hear the gospel and it bounces off them. Some hear the gospel and it's in one ear and out the other. And they walk in and out and they're the same, going in and out. And they take little thought for the gospel. But I want to tell you this. On this occasion, she understood for the first time in her life that she was a sinner, lost and undone. And she needed to be born again and saved. And furthermore, I want to tell you, the Bible says she not only heard, but here's what it says. And she attended to the things that were spoken of Paul. That's an interesting word, attended. You know what it means? <clears throat> Her mind was held by the preaching. I have been in gospel meetings and missions, and I have seen people sitting in the meetings, and they have never taken their eyes off me. Never. Never once did they blink hardly. And they sat transfixed, and I saw the Spirit of God work in their hearts, equally have sat or stood in meetings and in pulpits and have watched people and they have been restless and they've been looking at the watch. Hopefully you'll not do that now. And they've been saying basically in their heart, I wish he would give over till I get out of this place. This woman was different. You see, the word and the message grabbed her attention. We had something of that in our gospel tent mission where sinners were gripped by the word. And would to God we had days like that again. Sinners can come in and out of God's house. That's true. I've been to funerals and I, I'll be to more funerals. And I'll tell you this. People when you start to preach. They've got up and they've walked out. Now I don't know whether they're going back to work. I don't know whether they were feeling unwell. But knowing some of those individuals. They hate the gospel. I often wonder why did they come to the funeral. Why did they bother coming to church when they knew full well? And then to walk out and protest, I'll tell you, that's an affront to a grieving family. And I've witnessed it. But we can't always say, for we don't know their heart, what the reason for walking out, we don't know. But it's strange, it's when you come to the preaching of Christ that they just can't take it. They just cannot take it. But here's a woman and she's held by the preaching of Christ. It grabs her attention. The word of God now suddenly awakens her conscience. 
The scales fall off her eyes. Her ears are open to hear. Her mind is enlightened to understand. And she becomes concerned. And she becomes anxious. It's a bit like your television programs being interrupted some night during the week. About 8 o'clock. Young people, you never would remember this. You'd never remember this. Guarantee you, none of you young people would remember this. But when I was young, the television was interrupted by a security announcement. And all of a sudden you were watching something, even if it was the football. And the television was interrupted. And it says this is a security announcement. Would key holders in the town of Lurgan please return to their premises as an incendiary device had been found in certain shops. And your heart skipped a beat. And you were listening intently to what was being said. And at times, you heard an explosion. And you knew, that's what they're talking about. And if you were a key holder, you would be concerned. You became anxious. And that message gripped your attention and you were focused on it and you were out the door and you were in your car and you went into that property very carefully. And a lot of clothing shops, they had to search the pockets of the garments to find those incendiary devices before they went off. And I say this to you, she became anxious with the preaching of Christ. Outwardly, she looked right. But in, inwardly, she wasn't right. But can I say to you, finally, that eternally, Lydia was put right. In verse 14, it says, Who heart, whose heart the Lord opened. A miracle of grace is wrought in the heart of Lydia. Her heart that had been closed to the Lord for years had suddenly been opened. I preached for some 24 years to individuals in Lisburn Free Church. And I apologize for mentioning Les Pernigy and, and Cumber. I thought, I promised myself I'll not do it. But it's 24 years of ministry I can't forget and God richly blessed. But I remember sitting and thinking with the elders of individuals and praying for them. John Douglas preached to those people as well for another 20 years before that. Upwards of 40 odd years preaching to individuals like Jim Quigley. Individuals like Bertie Golly. And I never saw those people come to Christ. Never. And it burdened me. And I thought, they're good men. They're good people. Outwardly they look right, but inwardly they're not right. But eternally they were put right. And during the early days of the Reverend Roger Higginson's ministry, Jimmy Quigley came to Christ. I couldn't get over it. I'll tell you the truth. It was like unbelief. Are you sure? And Bertie Golly came to saving faith in Christ. You see, eternally, they were put right. And Jimmy's now with Christ, which is better by far. But I say this to you. That there was a wonderful change in her life. She was baptized. That's a public statement. A woman who before showed no real evidence of conversion but of morality was now baptized. And then her household. So her household had believed through her ministry. And then she was hospitable because in verse 15 she says to Paul and to the others, come into my house. It's a remarkable thing. Now you've got to see this. It's a remarkable thing that the church at Philippi started with a woman who was wealthy. She was the first convert at Philippi. This is how God built this church. He took Paul and sent him to Philippi. And he brought Lydia from Thyatira to Philippi. And the Lord saved her. And then when the Lord saved her, there was a demon-possessed woman in Philippi. And the Lord saved her as well. And then there was a cruel and a hard and a wicked jailer who cared neither for God nor man, and God saved him. 
And the first converts of the work at Philippi was Lydia. And the first convert was a demon-possessed woman that brought her masters much gain by her divination. And then their jailer, a cruel, wicked man. And here's what it says. The Bible says that the jailer and his household were baptized. And it says that Lydia and her household were baptized. And you can see now the church is growing. And they're able to found a church in Philippi. And I want to tell you something the Lord takes, doesn't he? The weak things of this world, the despised things, and he builds his church with it. I tell you, the material the Lord uses is people's castaways. I want to tell you that the Lord can save. That's what these conversions tell us as I close. The Lord can save those whose lives are controlled by the devil. The Lord can save those who are perverse and wicked and hard of heart like the Philippian jailer. And the Lord can save even those who are outwardly religious, good living individuals. For there's no difference, the Bible says, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And I'm glad tonight as I finish, there's room at the cross for you, for you can be saved tonight, irrespective of who you are, what category you had put yourself in. You can be saved tonight if you will come like Lydia. You will come like that demon-possessed girl. That you will come like the Philippian jailer. And you will cry out to God for mercy. What must I do to be saved? And all you've got to do is believe. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Believe that he died for you. Believe that he shed his blood for you. Believe that he rose from the dead for you. Believe that he will not cast you out if you come to him. And that you will call upon him tonight. And you will make sure that eternally... You're right with God. Remember Lydia and her conversion. Outwardly, she looked right. Inwardly, she wasn't right. But eternally, she was put right. Make sure you're right with God. Father in heaven, do bless now the preaching of thy word. Undertake, we pray, for this meeting. And we ask too, Lord, for our dear brother who has taken on well. And ask for our sister, for those who will tend to him. We pray that all will be well. We just commit it all to thee now. And we pray, Lord, for thy mercy and grace and help and blessing. We ask it all in the Saviour's name. Amen. Could we just finish by singing a verse uh, and the chorus of two, or 293, I think it is, 293. Just the first verse and the chorus of 293. I must needs go home by the way of the cross. First verse and chorus only. Let's all stand as we sing. Father, may those who are saved leave this house prayerfully and very carefully the pondering of things we have heard and grant those who are out of Christ without a Saviour, dumb and old alike, may tarry and wait and turn and seek the Lord. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.